Hello again everyone and welcome back to Fuel the Pedal. Today we are at episode 28 of the podcast and this is yet again your usual host Gabriel Martins. Thank you for tuning in and for allowing me to keep you company in the next hour or so, whether if you're running, cycling, driving or just doing some house chores or at least uh, these are usually the top things you listeners often tell me that are your favorite things to do while listening to Fuel the Pedal. Today we are talking about the underrated role of polyphenols in sports nutrition, again in a double guest episode, much like in previous episode 27, where we talked about red ass and eating disorders in endurance athletes. Today's guests are Professor Joanna Botel, a remarkable researcher from the University of Exeter, whose name I've seen countless times in PowerPoint slides from my first nutrition classes, and someone with a vast knowledge and experience researching on nutrient-induced changes in human physiology and metabolism and the application of this knowledge to both optimize athlete performance and to support healthy aging. And the other guest is a very special person to me and likely to most Portuguese nutritionist colleagues and students alike. We all have our mentors and people who we look up to in several areas of life, but for me, if there is someone for whom I have the most affection and the deepest respect and admiration is my dear colleague and friend, Professor Vitor Oco Teixeira. A person I was fortunate enough to meet during an important part of my academic training and with whom I've been working since then. And like many other colleagues in Portugal, we all owe him a lot for the excellence in nutrition training he gave us with rigor, class, real-life applicability and above all, common sense. I've been wanting to bring Vitor here to the podcast, not only for the tremendous professional and person he is, but also since Professor Vitor was, without knowing, the person responsible for the creation of Fuel the Pedal. And since I know that this topic of polyphenol in exercise performance is one that Professor Vitor is very passionate about, and one of the major researchers he has been citing during his classes is Professor Joanna Botel herself, who has been giving a major, major contribution to this field, I thought it would be a good idea to bring them both to Fuel the pedal to talk about this topic. So without further ado, let's get right into today's talk with Professor Joanna Botel and Professor Vitor Hugo Teixeira, episode 28, the underrated role of polyphenols in sports nutrition, up next on Fuel the Pedal Podcast. And here we are again in a double guest episode. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Joanna Botel. Hello, Professor Joanna. How are you doing today? Hi there, I'm very well, thank you, Gabriel. Nice to meet you. Well, it's nice to meet you too. Thank you for uh, taking the time to be here with us. It's a, a joy to have you here on Fuel the Pedal. And also my good friend and colleague, and I could almost say my mentor and a very important person for all sports nutrition in Portugal, Professor Vitor Hugo Teixeira. Welcome to Fuel the Pedal in Portuguese, finalmente. <laughs> Hi, Gabriel. It is a, a pleasure to be here. No problem. Thanks again to both of you to be here. It's an absolute privilege to have you here on Fool the Pedal. I am going to take this opportunity to repeat something I've said minutes ago before the interview. Uh, the reason and the incentive for the creation of Fool the Pedal came from Vitor Hugo himself. And I don't think he knows this, but uh, he indirectly gave me the encouragement I needed to bring this project forward in the first place. And also many other things I have to be forever grateful to Vitor throughout my career. So so I'd like to take this chance to give an additional thanks to you, Vitor, for everything. No, it, uh, it is uh, wonderful to listen uh, to this. Uh, you are a wonderful colleague and I want to congratulate you for the initiative to create this podcast that goes beyond the interests of those involved in cycling. And the quality of the guest who accept your invitation reveals that you were at the same time bold and nimble. And the high quality interviews were the result of uh, their altruism, uh, but also the reflection of your homework to prepare for the, the program. Thank you so much for your kind words, Victor. Uh, let's hope we can continue to translate science into practice uh, with this podcast. And today's episode is all about uh, bringing you the research available on polyphenols and sports and many other interesting stuff that I'm sure we'll get into. But first, I would like you to present yourselves uh, to the listeners. And I will start, of course, with ladies first. So, Professor Joanna, would you do the honors and present yourself to the listeners? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, so my name is uh, is Joe Botel. I'm a professor of uh, exercise physiology, nutrition, and metabolism. Uh, I'm based at the University of Exeter, and until very recently, the beginning of this month, I was um, head had the honour of being the head of the Sport and Health Sciences Department at the University of Exeter. 
But after five years, I handed over the the reins to my very good colleague, uh, Professor Mark Wilson, who's a who's a psychologist, uh, and I've now taken up the role of associate dean for 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 global for the for the college um, for one of the colleges within the university. In terms of my uh, sort of uh, research credentials and academic credentials, I started my career. Um, in the field of protein metabolism. So I did my PhD at the University of Dundee with Professor Mike Rennie um, using stable isotopes to look at the effects of dietary protein and exercise on on protein metabolism. Um, And I have since then continued to do research for numbers of years that I won't mention uh, in the field of, uh, of nutrition and metabolism, particularly in relation to looking at how we can support athlete performance um, using nutritional interventions, um, but as well looking at the, uh, there's obviously a close relationship with the uh, consequences of nutritional supplementation for health as well. So I have a interest in both areas, and it was probably about uh, just under ten years ago that I became interested in the in the field of polyphenols from both points of view, both from the point of view of um, their potential for enhancing athlete performance, particularly around recovery, but also looking at how polyphenols within the diet and within the form of supplements might be beneficial for health as well. So I look forward to the conversation today uh, on this topic. Terrific. Looking forward to this conversation too. Your turn, Vitor. The Portuguese listeners already know you, but for all the others, could you present yourself as well? Of course. Uh, my name is Vitor Teixeira. Uh, I have a degree in nutritional sciences, a master in food quality and a PhD in human nutrition. My research topic was on antioxidant supplementation and I think that's the, the reason uh, why I'm here. From that moment on, uh, we developed some research on the use of nutritional supplements in different athletic populations. We compared the effect of supplementation in relation to food, among others. Professionally, I have been been a professor at the Faculty of Nutrition of University of Porto for 20 years and since 2007 I have been sharing my time uh, to university and being the head of nutrition at FC Porto and also conducting some training courses for a colleague as you Gabriel. Indeed we are Vitor and hopefully we will keep up on contributing to increase the knowledge of young nutritionists here in Portugal in the field of sports nutrition. Yeah. So we have the perfect mix here to get into a very interesting discussion on this topic. Professor Joanna's background goes beyond the field of polyphenols with previous experience in protein metabolism as well, which will be very interesting to integrate in today's topic. And Professor Vitor, uh, not only with his uh, previous research on antioxidant supplementation in athletes, which we will get into later in our talk, but also for his field experience as head of nutrition at FC Porto football team, Football Club do Porto. So, allow me to do a previous introduction to this topic. So, exhaustive and unaccustomed intense exercise can cause exercise-induced muscle damage and its undesirable consequences may decrease the ability to exercise and to adhere to a training program. Many sports activities involve strenuous eccentric muscle contractions and explosive movements that can induce uh, muscle damage to varying degrees depending on the intensity and duration of activity as well as the training status of the individual. So prolonged endurance events such as multi-stage races in cycling, marathons, uh, ultramarathons and triathlons are examples as well, uh, can also place extreme demands upon uh, muscle uh, and can also induce ultrastructural damage and muscle soreness. It is therefore important to identify effective strategies for supporting rapid recovery between intensive training sessions, especially during pre-season when multiple sessions are completed in the same day or in between races as often happens during cycling. So one topic of particular interest with emerging evidence in sports nutrition is the use of particular strategies to enhance recovery in athletes with advances on protein and carbohydrate metabolism providing some of the central part of such research, but perhaps much less focus is put on on the role of uh, polyphenols in enhancing recovery from intensive exercise. This is why today we are having a double guest episode to try and give a complete up-to-date view on this uh, topic, on not only on the research available, uh, but the practical application as well. And at the end of the episode, you should be able to know the main dietary sources of polyphenols, other supplemental forms in which uh, context you should consider taking them or advise uh, their use and how much you should aim for. 
So a good way to start this interview would be perhaps to have Professor Joanna uh, give the listeners a general overview on what exactly are polyphenols and what is their biological significance for humans. Uh, thanks, Gabriel. Yes, so polyphenols are basically produced by all plants. Um, they're present within uh, fruits and vegetables. They fulfill an antioxidant function for those fruits and vegetables and help to protect them against oxidative stress, for instance, uh, produced through the processes of photosynthesis or through exposure to ultraviolet radiation. There are many, many different uh, types of polyphenols. Over 8,000 different chemicals have been identified so far. And they're characterized by their chemi specific chemical structure. So they have a phenolic ring within their structure and they have uh, two hydroxy groups. And the, the largest group of polyphenols is a family called the, the flavonoids. Um, and there are lots of different subcategories within that um, uh, classification of flavonoids. Perhaps the most important thing, though, from the point of view of, of humans eating fruits and vegetables is that they provide the taste and color characteristics um, for those, those fruits and vegetables. So the taste and color will depend upon the blend of polyphenols that have been produced by the plant. Um, and that in its turn very strongly depends on obviously the particular plant species, but also the conditions in which the plants have been grown. And this is has been grown. This is sometimes known as the terroir. So if we think about the fine wines that we, we find increasingly grown in, in England, but also obviously um, uh, within Europe and, and elsewhere, the, the taste of the, of the grape and the taste of the wine will depend upon the growing conditions and the species of grape that's included within the wine. Um, another example might be an apple growing on a tree. And if you observe where the red coloration on the apple is, you'll see that the red coloration is on the side that is exposed to the sunlight. So the plant is producing uh, a chemical called an uh, anthocyanin, which is present within the skin of the fruit, and it's protecting the flesh and the seed within of the fruit from the ultraviolet radiation. So from a human point of view, obviously the taste and color is an important aspect of the, the, of the foods that we consume. But also there's a lot of interest because uh, those polyphenols that fulfill an antioxidant function for the for the plant potentially when consumed by humans may also be able to provide an antioxidant function for for humans as well and and that certainly from from the research that i'm sure we'll go into certainly seems to be the case Fantastic way of starting this talk and we'll sure get into some of the things you've mentioned regarding what may affect polyphenol composition in different foods. But first I'd turn to you, Victor. Uh, since you've always been very practical and hands-on about most subjects in sports nutrition from all the classes you've given me and also taking what Professor Joanna just mentioned, I'd like to ask you what would be some of the major sources of dietary polyphenols in foods, but needless to say, those that are usually present in foods available in our diets. And I'll add a bonus question here. I know your athletes do consume enough polyphenols, but do you believe that athletes in general are paying enough attention to uh, polyphenol ingestion? First of all, the, the assessment of the dietary polyphenol intake is difficult, but has improved a lot with the development of databases such as Fennel Explorer, for example. In Europe, the average dietary polyphenol intake has been estimated at around 1,000 milligrams per day with coffee, tea, fruits and wine as the principal sources. This value is higher than the, the, the value that we found in the U.S. adults, that is around 250 milligrams per day, with tea being the primary source. When we look at the richest sources per 100 grams, we have on the top herbs and spices like cloves, peppermint, rosemary and capers and so on. But when we look at the amount per serving, uh, the best foods are berries, such as elderberry, shockberry, black currants, and blueberries. At this moment, we do not have recommendations for dietary polyphenol intake. We have not yet uh, established that uh, amount. We should be, in the future, uh, have uh, that value. I am not aware uh, of the polyphenol intake in athletes. I don't know if their intake is enough uh, or not to get the results that I want. But uh, I believe that at least 
in, in our team as they eat a lot of fruit and vegetables that are the main sources. And also uh, some of them drink a lot of tea because uh, they are from Japan or from South America. I believe that their uh, intake is also high. Also, we have uh, different sources of uh, polyphenols uh, that we use as supplements, and that also comes to, to the total amount. Uh, I believe that is important for sports-related issues, like uh, probably enhance uh, exercise performance or enhance uh, the recovery from muscle damage induced by intensive exercise, as you mentioned. But we also have to look to the epidemiological link uh, between high polyphenol intake and uh, the reduced risk of overall mortality, but more specific of some health conditions uh, such as systemic inflammation or oxidative stress or hypertension. So uh, it is very important to say also that it is very likely that the benefit for health comes from the combination of all of them rather by just one single one polyphenol. And uh, these results in, in the recommendation uh, is to increase fruit and vegetable intake, uh, but not use antioxidant supplementation, at least for chronic disease prevention. Some really important points there, Vitor, regarding the applicability of dietary polyphenols going beyond exercise performance and that food versus supplementation provision of polyphenols and antioxidants, which we will get into. And this leads us to the context of dosage, and in this case, ergogenic doses that cannot always be achieved with food when seeking to obtain benefits for a specific outcome in sports. And this is where some formulations such as concentrated juices or capsules could be considered. So I would ask you, Professor Joanna, what would be the main supplemental forms of polyphenol consumption to consider and what does the evidence say regarding this more concentrated and perhaps convenient forms for athletes in particular in endurance sports such as cycling in markers of muscle damage uh, recovery or even performance increase when taken prior to the exercise um yeah so uh, very good point i think the the adage of food first is always something that we should put um, precedence on. However, I, and I think there is also a real challenge as well, perhaps something that we'll come on to later on, that I think we haven't really had the, the research, the definitive dose response research conducted yet to be able to advise exactly what is the, the most effective dose to consume. So, so with those caveats, um, certainly it's clearly going to be uh, more convenient um, and easier for athletes to acquire um, polyphenols in high dose uh, from uh, supplements rather than consuming the wide variety of fruits and vegetables required to, to get a sort of a, a wide range of polyphenols um, within the diet. There are a number of different uh, supplements that are available, as, as you've already indicated, Gabrielle, in terms of um, uh, a powdered format that's available either in capsules or you can even um, uh, access the, the, the powder itself. The advantage of that um, compared to the alternative approach, which would be to take a, a, a concentrated um, uh, a cordial, um, is that within the powdered form, there's a much lower carbohydrate dose or sugar sugar content that might be advantageous for athletes in particular parts of their periodized program. And certainly if we're considering the potential for health application, um, then clearly uh, avoiding high sugar load might be, uh, might be uh, advantageous. So the the other uh, important aspect I think is that certainly from my my own research and from what I observe within the literature there seems to be a symbiotic relationship or synergistic effect obtained from the combination of polyphenols so just as we would see within fruits and vegetables we see a blend of polyphenols present within them that have naturally evolved presumably to provide an effective antioxidant function for the plant Similarly, I think it's important for us when considering the field of polyphenol research to look at a blend of polyphenols. So much of the research that has taken place has relied on using whole fruit supplements such as cherries and berries um, provided in the form of powder or concentrates. And I think that aspect is important, getting that, um, getting the benefit from the, the, the synergistic uh, combination of effects of the different polyphenols working together. 
yeah, that would be great to see those synergistic effects. But I'd really highlight for the listeners what you said there regarding the advantage of capsule forms versus concentrated juice or gels that would allow to provide almost no carbohydrate at all, uh, which is particularly interesting when aiming to reduce carbohydrate intake as part of a periodization program. So another interesting topic I think it's important to consider is that a polyphenol content appears to vary according to different conditions, mainly ripeness, cooking, storing conditions, and even dehydration processing. So, uh, Vitor, I would uh, ask you, how do these conditions affect polyphenol content in the different dietary sources we've mentioned so far? And also, since organic is back in the game again, now with this COVID-19 situation, is there any variation in the organic fruits and vegetables when compared to the convention ones regarding polyphenol content? Uh, As Professor Joana said, the polyphenol content uh, of plants is determined by several factors. Therefore, there is considerable variability in the polyphenol content of foods and supplements also that are uh, commercially available. We can say that uh, the literature uh, indicates that uh, organic food has a higher content of phenolic compounds, but not too much. Uh, let's say an increase of about uh, 10 to 20 percent. Uh, so we can expect a higher value uh, in uh, organic foods uh, of this amount, around 10 to 20 percent. We also have to look to other issues that I think that uh, are also important, such as polyphenol absorption and metabolism. That depends not only on the way that they were produced, organic uh, production or uh, conventional production, but also it depends on food matrix. It will also depend on uh, microbiota and probably it will also depend on on the training status. I'm aware of two studies uh, with different results. One of them showing that training increases the absorption of the phenolic compounds and the other study uh, saying uh, the opposite. So we have different uh, issues here and all of them may impact on uh, a way or another uh, the amount and the bioavailability of uh, phenolic compounds. So it is a very uh, difficult issue to, to sum up. So just going back there in what you said regarding polyphenol content of organic fruits and vegetables being 20% superior to those of conventional products, uh, their price isn't only 20% more, is it? The price is two or three times higher and the polyphenol content is only uh, 20% higher probably. Uh, We can look at another uh, topic such as vitamin and mineral content, but also uh, we do not find a very uh, big differences between Uh, the organic uh, fruits and vegetables uh, versus the the conventional ones. We also could look at the toxicological aspect, but uh, again, I don't uh, know if the higher prices means a higher uh, quality also. Absolutely. That was exactly the point I was looking for and this assumption that organic is always best. But still regarding this topic, well, first I would ask Professor Joanna if you have anything else to add to what Professor Vitor just said. And I wonder if you could get a little bit deeper into the polyphenol bioavailability issue and the factors that could influence it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think certainly I would absolutely agree with Professor Vitor that their that their bioavailability is relatively poor. So we do see um, increases in phenolic metabolites, so you know uh, absorption products from consuming polyphenols within one to two hours after consuming either a polyphenol containing supplement or, or or fruits and vegetables. So we do we do obviously they they are absorbed, but we think it's probably only between five to ten percent mm-hmm. of those dietary polyphenols that are absorbed on first pass as they as they go through the the small intestine where we can absorb those 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 phenolic metabolites and the rest so the remaining ninety to ninety five percent of the dietary polyphenols will progress through the um, digestive tract to get down to the colon or large intestine, but it's there where some fairly interesting magic uh, happens, which is obviously where those polyphenols will come into contact with the the microbiota uh, within the gut. And we know that those polyphenols can serve as uh, prebiotics. And so there's some interesting data, relatively limited still from human studies, unfortunately, but very good uh, suggestion that increasing polyphenol content within the diet can increase the level of some of what you might term the good 
the good bacteria within our gut. So things like bifidobacterium and so on that are suggested to have a, a sort of anti-inflammatory effect, maybe through production of small um, metabolites from their own metabolism, things like short chain fatty acids and so on. So there's a really interesting piece there around some of the favorable effects that we see from polyphenols might actually be generated through their interaction with the microbiome. But also importantly, those 90 to 95% of polyphenols that have progressed down to, to reach the, the, the bacteria in the gut. Obviously, the way in which they're serving as prebiotics is that they're being used as, as fuel effectively by those bacteria. So they're breaking those larger um, polyphenol compounds down into smaller uh, molecules that can then be absorbed. So we then see maybe even sort of 16 hours later, we see later peaks in other phenolic metabolites. And these are metabolites from the polyphenols that are being um, released by the action of the microbiota and then absorbed into the bloodstream and potentially having important biological effects as well. So it's a really interesting point and, and one that we need to do a lot, a lot more work on. We could perfectly do a whole episode just about uh, microbiota, couldn't we? Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah, and the relation with uh, the absorption of many compounds and the prebiotic effects you've mentioned there. So let's hope that this research comes out and the knowledge becomes more robust to dedicate an episode to it. So among all the sources of dietary polyphenols, there is one in particular that has been receiving a lot of attention in the past few years with a considerable amount of research on athletic population and its effects on muscle damage and recovery. I am talking about uh, Montmorency uh, cherry juice or simply cherry tart juice. I know Professor Joanna has some research performed specifically with cyclists, so I would direct my question to you and ask you about that one research, also about the different supplementation protocols that are described in the literature. And perhaps uh, it would be also interesting to tell the listeners just how it should be used, uh, for example, during a multi-stage race uh, such as the Tour de France or the Giro d'Italia, uh, where we have perhaps the physiological aggression that justifies its use. Yes, absolutely. Uh, obviously, really important question and, and core to the to the subject matter of this of this podcast. So, I think that there are I think two main uh, potential uh, aspects to the performance benefits that could be obtained from from polyphenols, and specifically thinking about um, the the Montmorency or tart cherry uh, supplementation. Um, and that focuses both in terms of potentially an acute performance test uh, effect. Sorry, um, and as you as you say, uh, Gabriel, we have. Uh, uh, some data from 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 my lab looking at this, and I can talk about that. And then we also have my own research and research from many others as well, which suggests that there are advantages uh, in terms of recovery through uh, tart cherry uh, supplementation. So if I if I maybe take the recovery piece first of all, because I think that's where perhaps the, ma the majority of evidence, the majority of research evidence lies. And obviously, when we're doing intensive exercise over successive days, such as uh, an event uh, like the Tour de France that places such a huge burden on the on the cyclist's uh, uh, physiology uh, and muscle physiology in particular, there's the obviously uh, a lot of oxidative stress and the potential for inflammation to take place within the muscle that is likely to cause a deterioration in, um, in performance. And so the uh, the effects of the polyphenols and specifically the tart cherry that, that I spoke about at the start, which is the potential for antioxidant effects and also um, evidence of anti-inflammatory effects as well. The um, suggestion is that the use of tart cherry through um, periods of intensive training or periods of uh, intensive competition during long duration uh, events such as the Tour de France um, is going to be highly beneficial. In terms of the supplementation protocol that's most most efficacious, I'm afraid I struggle to answer that question because I don't think we have a clear evidence base within the literature. We haven't done the dose response work yet to really identify what the optimal dose is. But from an analysis of the of the data that's available, the suggestion would be that consuming at least a thousand milligrams of polyphenols per day usually split across two doses distributed through the day, so morning and evening, to maximize the exposure to those polyphenol um, metabolites uh, during the course of the day, that that is likely to um, provide the, 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 the greatest degree of benefit. In laboratory-based studies that have been conducted where they tend to be a little bit simpler in design, where there would be a single bout of exercise designed to induce muscle damage, and then look at recovery over the subsequent 48 hours. This, again, the best um, evidence that we have would suggest that 
that the best effects seem to be uh, derived if that supplementation if there is a, occurs prior to the exercise. So in other words, we need a preload probably of around three days prior to the exercise. And that is to allow adaptation to take place within the muscle. And so I think, you know, coming back to the point around uh, bioavailability of the, of the polyphenols, the bioavailability is relatively poor. And so although um, there is evidence that uh, polyphenols are able to have an antioxidant effect. We now think that because of their relatively poor bioavailability, it's actually quite unlikely that they're serving as direct antioxidants. So scavenging the reactive oxygen species that are causing the, you know, part of the, the reason for the damage to the muscle during intensive exercise. It seems much more likely and there's evidence emerging now to suggest that in fact what happens is that those uh, phenolic metabolites that are absorbed in relatively low quantity when they uh, interact with reactive oxygen species that are produced in higher quantity during intensive exercise, those phenolic metabolites are themselves converted into oxidants and they actually trigger a response within the muscle to increase the level of our own antioxidant uh, systems, our own antioxidant enzymes, such as enzymes such as superoxide dismutase, um, that are responsible for protecting the muscle against reactive oxygen species. So, so kind of, uh, you know, uh, paradoxically, perhaps, um, the, the polyphenols have an antioxidant effect through serving actually as, as pro-oxidants, and they stimulate an upregulation of our own antioxidant systems. So that's why we think it's important to have this at least three day preload to allow that adaptive response to happen. So if you're doing a long duration event, continuing the supplementation throughout that period of intensive exercise should elicit a, a sort of better preservation of performance, better recovery uh, between successive bouts of exercise on, on successive days. And, and then so spinning back to talking um, a little bit about the potential for acute performance effects, there's still relatively uh, limited data specifically on Montmorency um, uh, cherry. Um, however, we, we did a study uh, published, I think it was last year, where we looked at, a, a, we were using a cherry powder for this a study, and we uh, supplemented athletes for a period of uh, seven days. And they took their last dose of a cherry supplement uh, 60 minutes prior to exercise. And we used a, a 10 minute steady state exercise bout. And we then asked participants to complete a, a 15 kilometer time trial. And we observed a 4.6% 4, 4 improvement in their in their performance of the of the time trial, we suspected because of the potential for uh, antioxidant mechanisms, we suspected that that one of the mechanisms by which performance might be improved could have been through an improved oxygenation of the muscle and improved delivery of oxygen to the exercising muscle. And so, to to test this mechanism, we used a technique called um, near infrared spectroscopy, which by which we just put a probe over the muscle and um, direct in uh, near-infrared light into the muscle. And we uh, uh, measure the, uh, the absorbance of that light, and that can give us an indication of whether the hemoglobin and myoglobin, the oxygen-carrying pigments within the muscle, have got oxygen attached or not. In other words, it tells us a little bit about the balance between oxygen delivery and utilization and whether um, uh, cardiovascular system is providing sufficient oxygen to the muscle to sustain performance. And what we observed in the steady state exercise prior to the time trial was that muscle oxygenation was uh, slightly enhanced within the, the tart cherry um, condition. We suspect that what is happening is that because of the antioxidant effects of the, of the tart cherry, we are having a protective effect on the nitric oxide availability, and that is helping to improve perfusion within the muscle. Again, I can go into a little bit more detail within the mechanism if that would be helpful. 
Well, that was actually the most complete and up-to-date overview of this topic I've ever heard, uh, which provides the listeners with a great summary of what we know so far about the cherry tart supplementation and the current limitations we still face regarding the dose response data, as you've mentioned there. But uh, perhaps when seeking to reduce muscle damage and improve recovery from multi-stage racing events, a dosage of 1000 milligrams per day split into two doses during competition periods and perhaps starting to supplement three days before that event might be a good starting point as Professor Joanna mentioned. But I would also like to keep focusing a great deal of attention in this uh, compound and have Professor Vitor share his experience with uh, cherry tart supplementation with his athletes or any other consideration you feel that uh, it may be important to share with us regarding this subject. Yeah, personally, I like to periodize uh, the intake of uh, antioxidants, uh, namely uh, tart uh, sherry. And uh, I try to mix these two important things, that is uh, training adaptation and, and performance. And we have some data, uh, 2018, I think, a meta-analysis showing that polyphenol supplementation increases performance by around 2%, probably coerced in a little bit more. But in, in order to, to get uh, the amounts, recommended that I think that are around 700 milligrams. Uh, we need a lot of foods rich in polyphenols. I think that they mentioned 200 grams of dark chocolate, uh, 300 grams of uh, berries. If we look at fruit juices, we will need around uh, one or two liters. It depends on the, the fruit juices. So it is a, a lot of food to reach this amount. We also have some data on uh, acute performance and uh, the amount is a little bit less. I think around uh, 300 milligrams in the last hour. Uh, Professor Joanna can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So we uh, look at these values and we try to include the best food options to reach uh, this amount on an um, acute basis. So when the, the performance is uh, the thing that I want. In other parts of the season uh, where uh, training adaptation is my goal. We do not use powders or capsules. We uh, only use uh, polyphenol rich foods and I don't believe that we reach the amount that I was talking about. We also use tart cherry powders, not only to uh, improve recovery, but uh, there are also uh, two studies showing that tart cherry juice and concentrate two times per day can increase sleep efficiency uh, as well as sleep time, I think probably due to the melatonin content of tart cherry. However, I don't know the bioavailability of that uh, melatonin, if it is high or not. Also, uh, I'm aware that we can find uh, food sources of melatonin with higher contents of uh, melatonin, such as nuts, pistachios, for example. Pistachios have a, a huge amount of melatonin, cranberries, mushrooms, so we do not have a lot of data on, on that. So I try to periodize the sources, the amounts, not only uh, during the season, but also during the week, uh, according to the number of games that we have uh, during a week. If we have only one, I uh, do one protocol. If we have uh, 10 games in a month that we sometimes have, I will do a different protocol, not only related to the months, but also related to the sources that I choose to, do, to give them. I knew it was a good idea to join you both to talk about this topic. So as Professor Vitor mentioned, and I remember listening to him talking about this in the 2019 Barcelona Sports Nutrition Conference, not only energy and carbohydrate can be periodized throughout the season, but also supplementation with antioxidant effects with the potential to inhibit training adaptations might need to be removed and rely solely on polyphenol food sources that don't have enough polyphenol content to inhibit those training adaptations. And before getting into the research you've performed, Vitor, that looks specifically at uh, antioxidant supplementation and the reduction of training adaptations, I would still insist a bit more here to close the chapter on cherry tart supplementation, uh, and I would direct this question to both of you. We know that some studies show that chronic supplementation with high doses of antioxidants such as vitamin C and vitamin E can inhibit these training adaptations, but although tart cherry is a polyphenol-rich supplement with some antioxidant potential, perhaps much less than vitamin C and E, could its chronic supplementation also contribute to inhibit this training adaptations at some degree? And we could start with you, Vitor, and then Professor Joanna can jump in right after. 
the, the decision to implement a, a nutritional strategy to attenuate effects of uh, exercise-induced muscle damage must be made with the potential negative uh, effects of these strategies also. So we are aware that the chronic use of many of these nutrients may also impair training adaptation. Maximizing recovery may be desirable in athletes who need to recover as quickly as possible. And this can be beneficial for athletes in tournament scenarios or with 10 games in a, a month. Uh, in another situations uh, during pre-season where the main goal is adaptation, uh, I think that uh, high antioxidant intake should be avoided. So the goal of nutritional intervention should be careful, considered in the context of this trade-off between recovery and adaptation. So a periodized approach to sports nutrition probably will uh, yield the greatest benefit for the athlete. But I really don't know if the, the kind, the type of antioxidants used will change uh, the, the responses. So I know that we, we have some studies showing that if we give them more than one gram of vitamin C per day uh, during long periods, or uh, let's say around 500 milligrams of alpha tocopherol, probably this this too, we can hamper uh, training adaptations. But uh, I don't know if these um, amounts are uh, well defined also for polyphenols. Probably uh, the number of studies that we have available is not enough to have a specific uh, amount. Also, polyphenols have a different approach because they are a group of compounds, not only one, and probably it is more difficult to uh, have huge amount uh, as it is possible to have with vitamin C and or E supplements. Uh, but I'm not aware of uh, a specific amount so, uh, or if it is a higher or lower risk to use polyphenols in order to hinder training adaptation. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Professor Joanna? What's your take on this? Yes, it's a really interesting question. And I would say, uh, I know that we want to talk later on about what the future research uh, uh, sort of priorities should be. And I think for me, almost top of the list should be to do exactly this study. So to look at the effect of uh, polyphenol supplementation, whether in the form of supplementation or through foods and the consequences for, for training adaptation. Because I think really the honest answer probably is we, we don't really know. Um, I can certainly talk about my, my hunches um, so c certainly, you know, I think the ev there is evidence there to suggest that supplementation with vitamin C and vitamin E um, seems to uh, blunt uh, training adaptation, at least certainly at the molecular level. Although I think the data, perhaps with regard to um, performance changes, are perhaps a little bit more equivocal. So some studies mm -hmm. show detriment and others don't. So that also is a, is a matter of controversy. So how, how relevant are the molecular data uh, to to the performance adaptation, which obviously from an athlete point of view is the most important thing, um, I would argue that in when we uh, you know when we talk about vitamin C and vitamin E and their role, they generally serve as radical scavengers. So effectively, what they do is they all mop mm -hmm. up the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species that are produced during exercise and therefore buffer their effects, reduce the level of oxidative damage that might be experienced within tissues. Now, that's perhaps helpful from the point of view of recovery, but if that oxidative damage and inflammatory response is part of the signal that triggers training adaptation, then clearly if you turn off that signal, you're potentially going to blunt training adaptation. Now, I would argue that if you consider polyphenols, though, the mechanism seems to be quite different, although there is some data to suggest that, that phenolic metabolites are able to um, uh, reduce the uh, activity of some enzymes that are responsible for producing reactive oxygen species during exercise, enzymes like NADPH oxidase that produce superoxide. There's some data to show that blueberry supplementation can can reduce the activity of that enzyme. So there is a chance that that some of the some of the effects of polyphenol supplementation, the antioxidant effects uh, are through that mechanism. But I would argue that with chronic supplementation, the main mechanism is through the mechanism that I spoke about earlier on, which is signaling through um, a pathway called um, uh, NRF2 and antioxidant response element pathway, which then results in an upregulation of our own antioxidant uh, enzymes. And that actually is also a pathway that is upregulated by 
training itself. So it, it's mm-hmm. actually a common pathway with training adaptation. So so for me, the the jury is out. My my, I, we clearly need to do that work to see what the see what the consequences are. But my hunch would be that um, it is unlikely that it will block training adaptation. But it there is a possibility that it might be additive to training adaptation. But I think it's unlikely that it's going to block um, training adaptation. But clearly, we need to do that work. There is one really um, interesting study. So it was a study done by uh, Covisto et al, where they, they looked at um, uh, in, put, put athletes onto a high polyphenol diet when they went um for a three-week high altitude training camp yeah and um it was they found uh obviously it was a relatively short duration and it was a a, you know using foods to enhance the antioxidant content of the diet but they found no difference in training adaptation other than actually a favorable effect in that the um hemoglobin levels were higher in the high antioxidant group so unfortunately there's really very little other data within the literature that will will give us the answer answer to this question so so yeah that's a a top top of the list for me in terms of future research and that study from Professor Anu Koivastu is also one of my top favorites to always show in classes when tackling this issue we are talking about here today of food versus antioxidant supplements and their impact on training adaptation in the particular context of altitude training. And we had here Dr. Trent Stellingworth on the podcast before talking about nutrition for altitude training specifically. So since we've pretty much covered uh, the issue of antioxidant supplementation and training adaptations, we can move on to a more contemporary topic and given the particular situation we are living in right now regarding the coronavirus pandemic we could almost assume that the trend in the next couple of years is going to remain to be this quest of for supplements that can support the immune function notice that i said support definitely not boosting which is something professor neil walsh has been insisting a lot on and perhaps uh, it would be interesting to obtain both our views on this one and this has been uh, quite a cliche question in the past weeks Do you believe that supplementing with high doses of vitamin C, for example, or any other micronutrient with antioxidant effects is of any interest to the immunity of athletes or the general population in this particular moment? Professor Joanna? So in the present context, I would say the most important thing for us to be thinking about in terms of protecting ourselves is to uh, reducing our risk of exposure to the virus. So clearly uh, using um, personal protective equipment and hand hygiene are clearly the most important uh, sort of step that we can take. I mean, I, I think there's there is some evidence in the literature to suggest that vitamin C at high dose in individuals who have um, high uh, levels of physical activity, that there may be some protective effect in terms of enhanced immune function. I, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't be, it's not a strategy that I would be uh, strongly promoting. I think there is interest, uh, if I come back to the to the uh, microbiome story, I think there is a lot of interest around the ability for dietary strategies that might alter the microbial uh, community to uh, have a beneficial effect in terms of gut barrier function, um, that there is some some interesting evidence coming out around that to suggest that, uh, for instance, diets with some fibres such as inulin might be beneficial. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not a strong advocate of, of, of those strategies in the present context. So, Vitor, I think you have quite a strong opinion in this matter. So, what's your take on yeah. this? Uh, on this, I was subject? listening. I was listening, uh, P- Professor Joanna, and I uh, remember that I was in two thousand one in London in a conference only about inulin and oligofertose. So, uh, in the last uh, nineteen years, I'm waiting for the, the answers. I uh, didn't uh, see uh, yet. So it's promising, but uh, we do not all have a lot of the data on prebiotics and probiotics effects on the immune system. Uh, we have some moderate support showing r- reduction in incidence of upper respiratory infections with polyphenols. Uh, with uh, flavonoids, with a reduction of about 30%, I think, if I remember uh, well. Also, we have 
some support on the use of uh, vitamin C, but in amounts that are easy to get with foods, uh, around 250 milligrams, probably a, a little more. Also showing a 50% decrease in the incidence of uh, upper respiratory tract infections. On the other side, on the side of uh, trying to uh, get our immune system stronger. I think that we only have zinc, a huge amount of zinc, uh, around 75 milligrams, that uh, likely can shorten the the common cold duration by around 30% also. So vitamin C, zinc, probably flavonoids are the ones that are on the top of the list now concerning human nutritional competence of the immune system. Let's see in the future if uh, this will change, uh, but the, the best response is try to have a healthy diet uh, with uh, an amount of energy that can sustain the proper function of the immune system. Great answer by both of you, really. Uh, if you allow me, I would only add something, and please jump right in if you disagree with me, uh, which is perspective and quantification. We know what the limited impact of such nutrition strategies and supplementation may have on immunity, but we know nothing about this virus. We do know what's protected us against uh, this virus, um, as Professor Joanna mentioned, but what we saw was an extreme search for immunity-boosting supplements, which I understand why uh, people engage into this search, but we are still in an era used to exaggerate the power of nutrition, and we'll come back to this point. Uh, but before that, uh, one last topic I would like to explore with you is the role of polyphenols during the periods of injury that requires limb immobilization and its effects on strength levels after immobilization. Is there any research on this topic worth considering? We can start with you, Vitor. First of all, um, when uh, athletes want to improve uh, the rate of uh, muscle function recovery uh, after damage, uh, they only remember protein and protein supplements. Uh, we know that protein supplements increase muscle protein synthesis, but uh, we do not have uh, data showing that they will decrease muscle uh, damage, uh, so we must rely on other options. We have some strategies that we can start using, and one of them is trying to increase the amount of foods that are rich in anti-inflammatory and antioxidant phytochemicals. We have some data showing that polyphenol supplementation can improve muscle function recovery as well as reduce muscle soreness and inflammation. Probably more in athletes that consume a low polyphenol diet because in most of the studies, they ask them to decrease the polyphenol intake. And uh, in this context, a uh, diet that is rich in polyphenols with huge amounts or, of fruit and vegetables may be the best strategy uh, in order to increase the recovery from damaging exercise rather than using a specific antioxidant supplementation. So uh, as a food alternatives, we can found berries, uh, green tea, probably some cherry juice that can reduce muscle damage and soreness uh, after exercise. Another issue that we uh, do not mention a lot is the, the polyphenol effects that they may ex exert on neuroprotection. Uh, we have some data showing protection of neurons against injury by the use of polyphenols because they can suppress uh, neuroinflammation. They also have the potential to promote cognitive function. So uh, there is also a chance of the use of polyphenols in this context. But personally, Personally, I believe more the effect of creatine uh, in this context. I think that it is the most promising supplement for traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vitor, for this allusion to the role of creatine for athletes who have suffered traumatic brain injury. And we also talked about this uh, back in episode 19 with Professor Graham Close, in case you're interested in knowing more about nutrition for injury prevention and treatment. Professor Joanna, what would you add to this topic? Um Yes, I mean, I think it is a really interesting question. To my knowledge, there aren't any studies that have been conducted yet in humans looking at the effects of polyphenol supplementation on recovery after limb immobilization. There are, I think, some promising data within the literature from animal models, firstly suggesting that supplementation with epicatechin, which is one of the bioactive compounds within um, dark chocolate, um, green teas and so on, 
um, suggesting that you can uh, cause uh, upregulation through this antioxidant response element pathway that I was talking about earlier on. There are also some interesting data to suggest that mice who are exposed to a training and then a detraining um, protocol, mice supplemented with epicatechin during the detraining phase actually retain function better. So I think there's some interesting lessons perhaps from some of the animal research. But in terms of human studies, I'm not aware of any. We did conduct a study a few years ago. We were interested in this potential mechanism, obviously considering the consequences of inactivity for loss of muscle and age-related sarcopenia, obviously, so loss of loss of muscle mass with, with aging, and the potential that there is an inflammatory mechanism at play within this. So in other words, a, a low level of background information within older muscle that might be contributing to the loss of muscle mass with age we were interested to see whether if we were to supplement uh, older adults with a more merency cherry supplement and therefore having an anti-inflammatory effect whether we could restore the responsiveness of that older muscle to a training stimulus and to um, a protein supplementation stimulus obviously normally those uh, training and protein supplementation should result in an increase in muscle protein synthesis and we know that that um, response is somewhat um, reduced in older muscle as an attenuation of that response, sometimes known as anabolic resistance in, in older muscle. And so we were interested in exploring whether supplementation with a with a more merisi cherry concentrate in this case would um, alleviate that anabolic resistance. Uh, so we conducted a study using um, uh, deuterated water to allow us to measure muscle protein synthesis um, in these uh, older adults. But sadly, <laughs> we didn't see any we didn't see any effect of the more cherry in terms of um, increasing um, muscle protein synthesis response, either in response to protein or to protein and exercise. So to my knowledge, there's no data um, uh, on this. However, I think if we if we think about it from a, a mechanism point of view, it is plausible that such effects could be seen. Animal data seem to be supportive of this, but to date, we have the there there is no sort of definitive study from with human participants that have uh, replicated this. Got it. And if we need to provide some practical information about the best value for money approach when looking to obtain the greatest amount of polyphenols for the least amount of money, and just to make this clear for the listeners so we can start to wrap up right after, I would ask you to clarify two things. One, what would be the best dietary sources to consider during chronic consumption when polyphenols from food are enough to provide the benefits we've been discussing here, but not enough to inhibit training adaptations? And two, when we're looking for acute doses to minimize muscle damage during periods of extreme exertion, what would be the best supplemental forms to consider? Vitor. Uh, my recommendation would be polyphenol-rich diet, uh, namely in high amounts of fruit and vegetables, probably also green tea on a regular basis, plus beetroot, concentrates per exercise, and probably tart cherry and pomegranate to concentrate pause exercise. Fruit juices can also be a good strategy if we want to increase the carb load, as they also have this function, and some of them have a, a ratio of glucose and fructose that is ideal uh, to give them carbs, and also they function as a water source, of course. So my recommendation is food-based and uh, use only extracts uh, peri exercise. Outstanding, Vitor. And how about you, Professor Joanna? Yes, I think I would agree with the, the definitely the, the, the food uh, first adage, uh, where at all possible. I think, you know, if we're talking about periods of intense exercise over successive days, then potentially there is a role for using more concentrated supplements alongside that, particularly if there's limited time uh, for con you know, consumption of sort of high quantities of fruits and vegetables. So I think there's definitely a role for supplementation in, the, in, in those types of circumstances. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I, I think this point was left quite clear with this episode that 
Athletes benefit from a regular ingestion of foods that are rich in polyphenols in a chronic fashion. And when looking for acute, higher and more concentrated doses, perhaps a cherry tart and pomegranate juice, for example, could be considered but not on a daily basis since this can hinder training adaptations. Remember that the training itself is an aggression and it is the recovery from that aggression that allows the athletes to become more trained and adapt. Oxidation is part of that aggression and it is better for the body to recover from that aggression alone than by providing it constantly with doses of antioxidants or substances that, that can reduce markers of muscle damage. So when aiming for a chronic consumption, foods such as blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, for example, but not only this ones, uh, as most fruits and vegetables are rich in such compounds as well as coffee, but since coffee already makes up for the majority of polyphenols we consume, perhaps it would be a good idea to vary in order to obtain different types of polyphenols since these are a vast group of substances whose content varies within the different foods we may consume. So we could start wrapping up here finally and perhaps leave the listeners with some uh, useful take-home messages regarding polyphenol use in exercise performance and research. You feel that is still uh, yet to be done. Uh, so I know Professor Joanna already mentioned one, so I would start with you, Vitor. Okay, uh, I think that a good take home message is that we should increase our intake of polyphenol rich uh, foods such as fruits and vegetables because they can uh, improve our health and also they can enhance performance. It is also important to mention that the polyphenols have an important uh, role in improving muscle recovery and also some of them taking pre exercise can also increase uh, performance. So we have health and performance related issues that support an increase in the recommendation in polyphenol rich foods. Yeah, I absolutely concur with Professor Victoria. It's always great when, when you can recommend a supplement that's good for performance and good for health, which uh, seems to be the, the situation here. But I would specifically say as well that if athletes are seeking to use polyphenol supplementation to uh, enhance endurance performance, then my recommendation would be acute supplementation um, and one to two hours prior to exercise mm -hmm. because at that point you will have the peak in the plasma phenolic yeah. metabolite so you're likely to capitalize on, on the, the performance effects perhaps through improved muscle perfusion and I would also say if you're seeking to use the polyphenol supplementation for um, enhancing recovery from intensive exercise and so on I think the evidence would suggest at the moment that there's a requirement for a for a preload for three days prior to that exercise in order to fully capitalize on the benefits and then to consume throughout that period of intensive exercise to derive the benefits. Um, in terms of research priorities, if, I think one of the questions kind of skirted over this somewhat, but I, I think one of the weaknesses within the literature within this field is, and, and I mentioned as well, that we, we, ha we don't have yet done the dose response work, so we don't know what the mm -hmm. optimal dose is. But our ability to do that is is compromised quite considerably by the degree of variation of uh, reporting in terms of what the polyphenol dose is associated with the dietary manipulation or with a particular supplement that's being utilized. So I think that's one of the things I'd really like to see is some attention to ensuring that when publishing research in this area, that people are presenting, uh, the, where possible, the, the, the polyphenol dose of the intervention that they're using, whether that's a supplement or a diet. And obviously the diet, that creates some, some, some real challenges. But I think it is important if we want to really try and get a handle on um, what the necessary dose is to derive the benefit. I think the other challenge is that a lot of the research that we've been talking about today has relied on using biomarkers measured within the blood yeah. Um, whereas actually what we're really interested in is what's going on in the muscle. So I think research looking at the effects of polyphenol supplementation within muscle using muscle biopsy techniques is also going to be a really important sort of leap forward for this field of research, as well as, as we've, we've all said, you know, there is a real need to do this, this work on training adaptation. Um, the last point that I'd that I'd I'd like to make is is also that, and Professor Victor he he mentioned as well that there is uh, evidence of benefits in terms of cognitive function with polyphenol supplementation, and we've done some work looking at healthy older adults and and have seen 
favorable effects on on brain perfusion and cognitive function and, and others have done similar work as well so i think this has been relatively underexplored as well so issues around decision making and cognitive function during exercise i think there's also an, an interesting area of research to be to be sort of uh, engaged in there there's there's very little data in that area that, that i've seen so far so so those are my pleas that's the the type of research that i think uh, would would really take the field forward Absolutely. Uh, Cognitive function is a really interesting field to get into, and it will be great to see research moving forward here. Um, This whole area of polyphenols is fascinating indeed, but as you've previously mentioned, there are limitations we may have to consider here, such as the fact that polyphenols are a wide group of substances with different effects, not one particular substance. Um, So it's not the same as studying, let's say, the effects of beta alanine and seeing what happens. And then we have the the issue with uh, bioavailability that can vary a lot between individuals, perhaps due to different microbiota composition. We still need uh, more data to talk in detail about this. But in general, let me just go back to a previous point I was trying to make here that is uh, related to some of your comments. For the majority of people in athletic populations, uh, most of them are not eating enough fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. So we end up going back to the same boring recommendation that we nutritionists have been doing so far and that Vitter mentioned which is eat more fruits and vegetables. And now all of a sudden we need to just consume blueberries, raspberries uh, that are already present in every Instagram picture on top of some good looking oatmeal slash porridge picture. Sorry. Anyway, but my point is most athletes who are not eating enough fruits and vegetables uh, perhaps don't need to suddenly eat all the raspberries and blueberries they can find. And I believe it's not the message we want to leave everyone with. And perhaps I digress. What do you say, Vitor? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Also, I can also add some things that we still don't know. We still don't know the combined effects of uh, supplementation strategies with uh, dietary approaches. We still don't know the interplay between those strategies and other treatment options, uh, such as cryotherapy, for example. Mm -hmm. We still don't know the impact of uh, polyphenols on uh, recovery and injury. So we still don't know a lot of things. Considering your question, yeah, that's why I mentioned fruits and vegetables generally, and also tea, because uh, personally, I don't like to recommend dark chocolate as a polyphenol food source, because uh, chocolate has a lot of energy and fat associated, and berries are not the best value for money option, as you mentioned before so we can find easily on nature some foods that have higher contents of polyphenols and are easier uh, to buy so uh, they are great options but they are not the the only options that we have available well it was about time that someone took dark chocolate from its pedestal professor joanna what would you add to this yes i think you know the the adage of of food first is always the right one so uh, increasing recommending a high fruit and vegetable uh, consumption to athletes, as I said, you know, as we have both said, uh, is helpful both in terms of uh, performance and recovery, but also in terms of, uh, you know, health. So that's uh, a really key point. I think that there is potentially a place for where athletes may find it difficult to consume sufficient fruits and vegetables uh, if there is a time constraint or if there is, you know, also issues around um GI distress if they're engaging in long duration exercise with limited amount of time for food consumption and I think that's where there is a real utility for using a supplementation and and then maybe focusing on uh, substances that have higher levels of of polyphenols within them so just from the the convenience point of view with with timing but notwithstanding I I agree that that you know that's another gap in our knowledge is if you look at the published literature on on polyphenol supplementation, some studies have employed a kind of low a background low polyphenol diet and then looked at the effect of supplementation on, or on top of that. My approach has always been to use the the background diet of the of the individual, so not to manipulate that background diet, and then to look at the additive effect of supplementation. Um, my feeling being that that's potentially more ecologically valid, um, you know, so more more real world relevant. Um, but I, I agree that is a, that there is a question still to be asked. So if if the if the fruit and vegetable uh, content of the diet is sufficiently high, do you not get any additive or benefit of the supplement? And uh, we don't know the answer to that question. I suspect I suspect that there will still always be room for a bit more. 
Fantastic. Really relevant information there and the question marks to consider for the future. So, Vitor, if people wish to follow you on social media and look out for some of the things you publish, where should I send listeners to? Uh, I have a Facebook and an Instagram account. They can find me in Instagram uh, with V uh, Ugu Takes. That's not the best <laughs> name to have on Instagram, but uh, that's a way that I have that uh, try that the followers are really followers and they have it's hard to find me, but that are the ones that I want to be there so they can uh, find me on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Sure. I'll make sure they find you. I'll provide the links on the, <laughs> on the website. I have uh, to change the username <laughs> to a friendly one. <laughs> <laughs> to get more followers. Um, how about you, Professor Joanna? Yeah, so I have a, a Twitter. Um, my Twitter address is uh, at, twi- at Joe Botel. Quite hopefully simple to, to remember, although the spelling of Botel might be tricky. Um, and then they, I can also be reached through my University of Exeter email address. So that's uh, j.botel at exeter.ac.uk. So either of those are, are the, a good way to get hold of me and, and happy to, 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 um, to discuss uh, this exciting topic. Terrific. I will also make sure that people uh, find you and I'll include the links on the website. So, uh, Professor Joanna, Vitor, it has been a, an immense pleasure and I should say an honor to have you both here on Fuel the Pedal. I, I truly hope uh, you enjoyed uh, coming here and I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be here today. Thank you. It's been great. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. And congratulations for this amazing podcast that you have. It's the, the only way uh, that I have to, to keep running because I hate running. Uh, and <laughs> and since, since uh, the lockdown and with the gyms closed, the only option for me to exercise is to run. And uh, I have only two podcasts that I hear when uh, I'm running. One is from Malcolm Gladwell and the other one is yours. So I'm putting you on the level of Malcolm Gladwell. (laughs) Well, uh, I'm flattered and uh, also glad to know that I'm contributing to your physical activity (laughs) as well. It's good to know. It's actually a top favorite thing to do while listening to the podcast that listeners often mention that running and car driving seem to be the most uh, popular activities. So again, Professor Joanna, Vitor, uh, thank you so much for your time and patience and hope to talk to you soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I really have to say that I'm thrilled and really happy with the final result of this episode, not only for the immense admiration I have for both guests, but also for the really practical knowledge that has been shared here with a lot of common sense and recognition of some of the limitations this area still faces. And let's hope Professor Vitor keeps on running while listening to Fuel the Pedal. To the rest of you, thank you again for tuning in and listening to another episode of Fuel the Pedal. Needless to say that the episodes are going to keep on coming and you'll hear from me soon take care guys